China has a huge lead on electric vehicles, by far, and everybody acknowledges it. Europe has a mandate that they will phase out the internal combustion by 2035. Will they allow Chinese manufacturers to come to Europe and pretty much overtake the uh, European car manufacturers or not? That won't happen in the United States. If a Chinese car manufacturer tried to set up shop in the United States, there would be congressional hearings, there would be accusations of spying, you know. So it's not happening in the United States, it's happening in other parts of the world. And I think we miss the big picture when we just focus on the U.S.-China relationship. So that's my point of view as a, as a Mexican watching. And Jorge has been on Twitter really trying to hammer this point home. And he's been really interesting because, again, he has been a contrarian voice in the panic that's really starting to settle in in the United States about the thought that Chinese EVs made in Mexico could come in under the North American Free Trade Agreement, sidestepping the current 27% tariff. Now, here's something that Jorge wrote the other day. He said the idea that China is sidestepping U.S. tariffs through Mexico is narrative-based, not data-based. He says part of our, quote, immigrant invasion coming through southern border, unquote, fentanyl from Mexico killing our children, unquote, and now, quote, China using Mexico political narrative. So, it's really hard to sort out what's happening here. Chinese EVs, though, are a force that we're going to have to deal with all over the world, for better and for worse, depending on where you're sitting. And this is a really complex issue that I think a lot of people aren't following, especially if you're in the U.S. You may be following what's happening in the U.S., but unaware of what's happening here in Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico, um, BYD and the Chinese companies are a force to be reckoned with. We haven't even talked about South Africa, where Chinese companies like Cherry and Haval and Great Wall Motors are killing it. I mean, they're in the top 10 now, displacing some of the Korean, Japanese, and European brands, and even some of the Americans. So let's start first in China, okay, so we can get our head around what's happening. I said at the beginning, there was this concern from Chinese automakers that sales are slowing there. So in order to keep their volumes up, they're looking overseas now to expand. That's been a, one of the old playbooks that the Chinese have used for a long time. Give us a sense of what your read is today of the Chinese EV market domestically before we look at internationally. Well, there's two things going on. There's this kind of the, you know, I would describe it as not a slowdown, slowdown. But if we were talking about the China EV market going at 100 miles per hour before and the rest of the world were going at 50 miles per hour trying to catch up. Now China's kind of going 70, 80 miles per hour, but the rest of the world seems to be stalling. I think that's the way I would describe it, uh, kind of the market situation. But the two things going on is, well, naturally for any auto market, now they're trying to become this powerhouse of not only autos, but pretty clearly EVs that it would be natural to expand globally. That's the same for the U.S. automakers. It's the same for the Japanese, for the Koreans, for the Europeans. So that's number one. But number two, given the kind of the growth over the pandemic. I think we need to really talk about some of the factors why there was so much growth. And I would think of three, and this will be successive. So from 2020 is the year when Giga Shanghai Tesla started production of the Model 3. I think that was one of the catfish effect, uh, so-called. In 2021, a small Wuling Hongguang Mini EV was launched that quickly popularized the really the micro A00 segment. And that segment is 100% battery electric vehicles. Okay, let me, let me just stop yeah. you there because I think there might be some jargon there that some of our listeners may understand. So number, <laughs> well, number one is Wuling is a joint venture with General Motors, no less, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, the SIC GM Wuling, yes. Yeah, so GM actually has a stake in this. And then you've talked about this A00, which is the smallest class. And these are popular, by the way, also in Indonesia. The Wuling has just started in Indonesia. And they've been a first mover there. And they've done very well. So these are these tiny little cars, right? I mean, really micro cars, if some almost. It's almost like a golf car sized EV. And then in 2022, obviously, we talked about BYD is when BYD announced in March 2022 
that they stopped production of pure, you know, ICE driven vehicles, internal combustion engine. So these three things, plus, you know, China was nearing the end of uh, subsidies, which ended at the end of 2022. So all of these factors combined, I think, pushed the market plus the pandemic, you know, people wanted to have their own cars and EVs, the number of models launching. So and now you built this capacity. There's so many brands. There's still brands. This is this coming Beijing Auto Show. Dozens, right? I mean, we're talking. Yeah. I look at my hands like, yeah, there's a handful of brands still launching. And we're in 2024. So you have this glut and you have this drive to go global. That's why now how I describe it was more recently, the Western world seems to have woken up to this if you want to call it the China threat, you know, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. I probably will be on middle ground between Trump and the guy uh, Gordado. Well, well um, let me get your take uh, get, on Mexico in a second. But let me just still want to stay in China before we, we go overseas. Sure. The adoption of EVs in China, though, wasn't organic and it wasn't consumer driven. In many cases, as you said, there were subsidies. But also, if you wanted to get a license plate, which is effectively the equivalent of registering your car in cities like Shenzhen you couldn't get one if you had a gas-powered car at some point they said only EVs in cities like Shanghai they gave preference to EVs they lowered the cost of the registration also the license plate in a city like Shanghai determines where you can go in the city in terms of can you go on the highways at certain times and whatnot and EVs got preference lots of public policy behind the push for EVs they also had this amazing infrastructure, I mean, charging networks everywhere, which, of course, made it really convenient. And that's the problem we're facing in California, is that people have bought EVs, but they were kind of told that you can charge it all over the place. But really, they should have been told that this is a charge at home type of product. And so there's been a lot of frustrations with the U.S. charging network here in Vietnam, just seeing the first chargers come out. But China went all in on that infrastructure, and that really helped a lot. So talk a little bit about the adoption, because in the West and in other markets, they're depending on consumers to drive this, not public policy. But in China, public policy played a critical role. Exactly. And it's important to point out that the rise of the China EVs, the, the take rate or the, you know, it's, it, it didn't happen over the pandemic. It happened over a period of time of educating the market, of building out this infrastructure, which is all standardized. So any type of EVs can be charged at any type of these chargers that are in place. And I had that experience when I was in China for two months last summer. I drove quite a few different EVs and every different type of whether it was Shell, whether it was one of these joint venture, locally, third party, state owned, state grid. Star Charge, all of these charging operators, the only thing you needed to do was scan and plug and charge. And so it's not like in the US where all of these automakers now having to adapt to the Tesla's NACS in order to enjoy their supercharging network. So there's no hassle there. I think that's a very important part of reason why the EVs have grown so much in China, not only because of the availability of these tech feature rich, but also the infrastructure availability. I think all of these factors, plus the, you know, the subsidy uh, system that were in place actually since 2014 is when they started the subsidy system, which ended in 2022. 